Okay, VM settings and features. New in VMs, Dave talked about this yesterday. Um, a virtual machine now can have up to 64 virtual processors. It's very important that these virtual processors, when they're allocating memory to processes running in the guest OS, that they do this efficiently to respect the physical hardware boundaries of the host you're running on. So to do that, Microsoft have enabled guest NUMA support. So this is where the physical architecture that the virtual machine is running on is actually revealed to the guest OS. So it can efficiently schedule those processes and memory allocations. That works with Windows and Linux. By the way, Linux is supported. And Dave mentioned that yesterday. In fact, I think there are more Linux distros and additions on the supported list than there are Windows ones now, um, which is quite a, an achievement on TechNet. A uh, terabyte of RAM. So 64 logical pro virtual processors. That's 64 logical processors, which could be 32 cores with hyper-threading, or just 64 cores. That's a very powerful virtual machine, especially if you start guaranteeing it time on those cores. A terabyte of RAM, that's a lot of memory. I've gone into sites where, where I've asked them, have you done virtualization? Yeah. How many of your servers have you virtualized? Ah, a good 40%. That's why have you not done the others? Ah, uh, well, they require too much processor and memory to be virtual machines. That's BS this time now. Complete BS. If you size your hosts right, you can run your servers as virtual machines, and they become more flexible and easier to manage. And we know, statistically, the flexibility is the number one reason people are doing virtualization now. Um, and strangely, when I did the UK launch, there was one person stuck up his hand in the 1,000 room audience, uh, or a 1,000 audience room. Um, who said that wouldn't be enough for one of his applications. <laughs> Which I never got to talk to the guy, I wish I did. Um, four virtual SCSI controllers with up to 64 virtual hard disks each, each of which, as I mentioned earlier, could be VHDX, which go out to 64 terabytes. So that's a whopping amount of storage you can put into a virtual machine. And we can have eight synthetic network adapters. Those are the ones that give you the best performance. And up to four legacy network adapters. These are the ones that give you crappy performance, but they do support uh, Pixie if you want to do OS deployment over the network to your virtual machines, which, to be honest, doesn't make any sense when it's much quicker to deploy a template virtual machine from a library. Uh, we now have virtual fiber channel adapters. So if you have fiber channel SANs, you can reveal physical LUNs on those fiber channel SANs directly to your virtual machines if your HBAs on the host support NPIV, which is network port something virtualization, identification virtualization or something. And you can even do in-guest uh, MPIO for those virtual machines. Um, and that is useful if you want to create guest clusters. Hyper-V supports guest clusters of up to 64 nodes. So that's 64 virtual machines all in a single cluster at the guest layer, not at the host layer. Um, and no, we do not have virtualized USB or SCSI controllers. Uh, Microsoft are aware that there are some people out there who want these features. It's on the list, but it's way down low because they do not hear from people saying that they want it or they need it. In fact, the need it is more important than the want it. Um, so if you do need virtualized USB or virtualized SCSI controllers, then let Microsoft know so they can bump it up the list. Okay, so virtual machine, we'll have a look at one. Okay. So hardware that we can add if the machine was turned off. I could add myself another three SCSI controllers on here. There's one already by, de uh, by default. Um, I can add network adapters. Uh, network adapter is the synthetic network adapter. We can add virtual fiber channel adapters, and we can add support for remote FX. So this is where a virtual machine takes advantage of graphics cards that you can put in the host for graphics acceleration. So if you need high performance graphics in your virtual machines, in a VDI or virtualized uh, RDS session hosts or terminal servers, you can do this. And remote FX also gives us, um, it's a whole brand now at this point, it gives us better cross WAN uh, RDP, um, actually it's called rem remote effects now, it's not RDP, and USB device redirection through our sessions. Memory, we have dynamic memory, so this is where virtual machines can dynamically grow their memory 
So we, they start up at a certain amount and then grow up to a certain amount and hand back the memory when, be, uh, when it's no longer used. We have a new setting called minimum RAM. That one right there. That can be as low as 8 meg. Microsoft did a lot of work with Windows 8 and Windows Server 2012 to make it more efficient when it's idle. So, and it's particularly important for VDI. When you have lots of virtual machines, and I've seen this in the hosting world, that are not being used, it's great that you can get their memory back to their startup amount of RAM, which might be one gig, but we'd like to get back as much as possible. So Windows 8 and Windows Server 2012 require 512 megs of RAM to boot, but they do not need that to run. I've had my idle Windows Server 2012 VMs go down to about 200 megs when they're sitting there doing nothing. That means those idle VMs are now consuming less resources. And that's particularly useful if you combine this with something like Virtual Machine Manager 2012 Service Pack 1 and turn on the power optimization feature where you squeeze your virtual machines down because they're idle to fewer hosts and you start powering down hosts automatically then power them back up again when the workload grows. So not only have you saved money on your power by virtualizing, but you're starting to squeeze that load down like an accordion when it's not got any pressure on it. And then you grow it back out again when there is pressure. Processor. Here's where you can actually configure basically QoS for the virtual processor. So you can guarantee certain virtual processors a certain amount of time or quanta on the physical cores that they're running on. This is pretty much recommended for something like SharePoint. Um, when you virtualize SharePoint, the guidance from them is to guarantee the virtual processors 100% of the cores that they're running on. And that's just their virtualization guidance. That is not Hyper-V guidance, that is their virtualization guidance. So it's the same across all the hypervisors. So I can do that if I wanted. I could say that that's not 1,000%, 100%. Uh, and that means that those cores are owned by that virtual machine. Nothing else can contend for those cores. So that's where you get the near physical like performance for virtual machines. That is not a Hyper-V thing, that is just a virtualization thing. But you can expand this out. Got our compatibility stuff for migrating virtual machines to older or uh, processors. Um, and actually it's, on, it's in PowerShell only now, but we can also turn on legacy processor mode so we can support operating systems like NT4. Uh, and we know there's still some NT4 out there. And um, we have NUMA. So if you have hosts with different NUMA architectures, um, you can use a tool called Core Info to figure that out. Um, if you do have that, then you can customize the NUMA architecture of your virtual machine to match the smallest NUMA architecture of your nodes in that particular environment. So, and then I'm gonna jump right down to Network Adapter. This is where I can configure the virtual switch that my virtual machine is being bound to. I can enable VLAN identification and bind that virtual machine to a specific VLAN. John was going to show you a better solution again. And if I want, I can manually do my QoS for this virtual NIC right here. So I can guarantee it a certain minimum amount of bandwidth, and that's the recommended approach because it's flexible and allows bursting. But say I have a troublesome VM. Its application is misbehaving and trying to eat up the entire LAN. Well, I can set maximum bandwidth here until I fix the problem and stop it from eating up the network, but leave it kind of operational in the meantime so I can troubleshoot. We have hardware acceleration features. These are turned on by default, these two here. And the reason is, and they don't do any harm by being on, basically if they find hardware that is configured that they can use, they'll use it, and they'll improve the performance of the host and the virtual machine. And if they don't find the hardware features configured or available, well, they won't do anything. So that's why Microsoft has checked them by default. Single root I.O. virtualization, or SRIOV, is a new thing in the Hyper-V world. It's sort of new in vSphere as well. Basically, it bypasses the entire hypervisor for the networking. So the virtual machine actually communicates sort of directly with the physical NICs. Um, that does not support NIC teaming at the host layer because the traffic never gets to go through the NIC team. Um, that is a new feature. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, do a search for a guy called John Howard, and it's J-O-N. Um, and S or hyphen IOV and he wrote I think it's seven or eight blog posts and he's a great video showing the thing in action including supporting live migration which we can't say of the competition and here we have more features in here so we can 
set static MAC addresses, very important for Linux, because Linux associates uh, IP configuration with a MAC address. Uh, we can do MAC spoofing if you want to do uh, network load balancing within the guest OS. We can turn on some nice cloud features, DHCP guard. If I check that, it prevents the guest OS in this virtual machine from being an active DHCP server on my network. So stop those dodgy software developers and testers from firing up DHCP servers when they think they're creating new networks. Been there. That's lovely fun. And this one's an IPv6 one, um, so stop router advertisement. So again, stop a machine from advertising itself as being an IPv6 uh, router. Put the next one is for those people who want to do traffic analysis in quality controlled environments or change controlled environments. We can configure mirroring mode so basically, we can mirror the network traffic of a virtual machine to another virtual machine. So any tr I can set this to, uh, to source mode. So basically, it forwards its traffic to another virtual machine on this virtual switch, which is in destination mode. And that other virtual machine, I could run network load monitor, Wireshark, whatever, and actually analyze the traffic of this virtual machine. Pretty important, say you're in pharmaceutical, you've got some virtual machine that's misbehaving, you want to install a tool on it, but you can't do change in the pharmaceutical world. It takes weeks, if not months, to get that done. Instead, you change that setting there, and then you do your tool installation on another virtual machine so you don't actually Im impact anything or make any change. And again, NIC teaming. We can do NIC teaming inside a virtual machine. By default, it's off. Because we don't, in a cloud world, we don't want software developers and all that sort of thing to be mucking around with this stuff. But if we check that little box there, we can enable NIC teaming in a guest OS. So on that fourth mode for the mirror mode, then do you have two VMs or three that are set up for destination and source? Yeah. Or does it know where to go? It just does. It, it sends to all of them, to the destinations. But it wouldn't be recommended to have a third mirror mode? You'd, ha you'd have one in destination mode. Okay, so that's a quick tour through the VM settings and scalability stuff.